muchas. Sí, a mí no me problema. encanta. Expo, ¿no? <ríe> This is so great. Um, <laughs> you let me know, Monty's, how you're gonna start if, uh, for everybody that's tuning in. Hello, hello. We're gonna start in just a moment. Let everyone kind of settle in for a second, and then we will get going. Okay. Welcome everyone, my name is Maris Kreisman and I run events and marketing at McNally Jackson and I'm so thrilled to welcome you tonight to another excellent virtual event for the store. If you go to McNallyJackson.com and look at our events calendar, you'll see all the amazing writers and programs we're hosting in the coming days and weeks. I'm adding more every day, so please keep an eye on the site or subscribe to our newsletter to hear more about what's coming up soon. There will be time at the end of tonight's conversation for your questions. You can use the Zoom chat function to submit any questions you have and we'll get to them before the end of the evening. We're so glad that even though we can't all be in the same room, we're still able to host events like this during this difficult time. As we've changed phases from staying at home to opening for curbside pickup to again admitting customers into our four locations, indie bookstores like ours still need more support. And so if you enjoy free events like this and want us to keep hosting more of them, please buy books from us. I'll post links to buy Paula's book in the chat. And I will also post a link to our events fund because we would really appreciate any donation you can spare. And now I will stop begging and introduce the author of Finding Lab Next, uh, Paolo Ramos, who is a host and correspondent for Vice and Vice News, as well as a contributor to Telemundo News and MSNBC. Ramos was the deputy director of Hispanic media for Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign and a political appointee during the Barack Obama administration. And she also served in President Obama's 2012 reelection campaign. She's a former fellow at Emerson Collective. She received her MA in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School and her BA from Barnard College and Columbia University. She lives in Brooklyn. Thank Joining you. her in conversation tonight, receiving a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 2018, Zoe Saldana is herself the epitome of a true star in Hollywood, earning a reputation as a versatile and respected actress by choosing roles that she feels passionately about. Notable film credits, just in case you didn't know, include <laughs> Avengers Endgame, Oscar nominated film Missing Link, Avengers Infinity War, Guardians of the Galaxy, Live by Night, Star Trek Beyond, and Avatar. Recently, she wrapped production on Keyhole Garden, tracing the romance of a man and woman whose love for each other struggles to overcome the divisiveness of life on America's southern border. Furthermore, she's spending time behind the camera with her film production company, Sinistar, founded with her two sisters. She's currently focused on Bise, her digital platform reshaping the cultural narrative of shining light on the untold stories that reflect today's America. This platform provides a voice to Latinx youth through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, as well as YouTube videos and podcasts. It fills a niche for young Latinx audiences craving po positive portrayals of the modern American experience. Saldana was born and raised in New York. When not on location, she resides in LA with her husband and three boys. It's my pleasure to have you both here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Paola, yes, thank you I'm so, so much. Excited to be having this conversation with you. I, I mean, me too. Really, really, really excited. Thank you for doing this. Of course, of course. So, I mean, I, I, Let's start by uh, talking about the big elephant in the room, which is a word that I, I learned three, I would say four and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, it was hard, it was hard, you know, slipping out of my mouth at first. But then once I started talking to so many young people in America and how they identified with this word and the pride that they felt, now I can't, I, I can't imagine a world without this word. And the word is mm -hmm. Latin. So the way, so first of all, I think you're right. I think there's there's a lot of controversy behind the word, right? I think people are instantly sort of unsure when you introduce like a new, a new word in the vocabulary, there's a lot of rejection. But to me, when I break it down for folks, I'm just like, 
it is a more inclusive way of referring to the 60 million Latinos of us that live in this country, right? The X that a lot of folks are sort of scared of is nothing but an invitation for anyone among us that has ever felt left out of the community at some point, right? Left out of a label, of a story, or of us. So that is if you're Afro-Latino, if you're queer, trans, indigenous, if you're conservative or liberal, um, it is a word for all of us. And I, I do think it forces us among the controversy, right, which which rightly so, and I invited, at least it forces us to understand who we are, or like it forces us to look at ourselves for the first time that I don't think we've done in, in a really, really long time. What, what what attributes to that, do you think? Um, I think we've, we've let like mainstream media and posters and these like massive companies sort of label us with numbers, you know, and that's sort of become the story. The like, you know, the, our story has always been the power in numbers, you know? Um, and I think we've sort of let that go. I also think that, I just think about my, my dad, you no, know, and, and my parents when they came here, and I think the story sort of remained with them, you no? Know? It was it was the the story, the immigrant story, you no? Know? That was the journey, how you came here and, and why you came here. And I think we left it at that. And I think the gap is that we haven't really understood what the children of immigrants did with like all of the rights that they fought for for us, right? So like, what have I done? Um, and how have I stood in my parents' shoulders, right? What have I done for, with all of the rights that, that they came to this country for, no? And I think that's the gap, no? The, the evolution um, that we haven't really just spent time looking at and understanding. Is that the reason why you were, you were compelled to write a book about it? I wrote the book, so it, honestly, it was exactly four years, literally four years ago, almost. It was November, November 6th, I don't even, I blanked out the last election, 2016, but it was exactly in 2016. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I have blanked it out, but it was, it was, I'm in the Hillary Clinton campaign, right? And my fancy role there was deputy director of Hispanic press. And so, you know, regardless of your political inclination, I think a lot of people did expect um, the Latino vote to be the main story um, the morning after the election, right? Because I think a lot of people thought that we would show up in unprecedented numbers and that it would be Latinos who would be responsible for ensuring that Donald Trump didn't make it into the White House, right? Yeah. You could agree or disagree, but that was sort of what we all expected. Um, and we were wrong, right? Less than 50% of Latino eligible voters actually showed up, like less than 50%. And so that just made me you know, that just made me question my own assumptions and made me question a lot of my own work. And it made me question if I even knew what the hell I was talking about, right? When I referred to ourselves and when I thought about outreach and that was sort of the, the birth of the idea, right? Like who did we miss in 2016, right? When we were traveling to all of these battleground states, who weren't we talking to? Who were we turning away from? And who, again, how had we changed in the last years? And all I had to do was look at myself, no? And, were we talking to queer Latinas? Uh, were, we, were we having conversations beyond immigration? And, and I, we did slightly, but not enough. And so that was sort of what prompted me to look into it. That's, it's so amazing. It's, it's so amazing because I, I, one of the reasons why I, I wanted to do, you know, be say was because mm -hmm. as, as a Latino, as a Latinx collective, yeah. um, yes, we know so much about each other and about ourselves but then there's that question how much and how deep are we exactly. like a mile wide and an inch deep and and when what after i became a mom that became such a a permanent you know inquiry for me because i'm like uh -huh. who am i where do we come from why did my grandmother come here in 1961 like yeah. what was life like under a dictatorship of someone like Trujillo in Dominican mm -hmm. Republic. What did America represent for her? Why didn't she aspire to mm -hmm. go to college? But by doing, you know, working, you know, in factories as a seamstress and everything, mm -hmm. she still managed to give us the best of everything, but there was still a chunk of, of that of that history that we were missing. Yeah. Sometimes they're, it's too painful for our ancestors to talk about, right? But it's the chunk that we're missing in right. order for us to understand how we vote. That's exactly right. How yeah, and I are, and that's exactly what you just described is is a lot of the theme in the book, um, and is a lot of what I already am seeing in terms of the people that are voting, right? Those young Latinos that are voting. I think it's what you just said. It's it's people, it's a generation that have seen their parents and their grandparents assimilate, you no, know, succumb to inequalities. 
sort of say yes to everything because you know it was for them a privilege to even be in this country and i think that the younger generation and, and, and just more people are looking at that and they're rejecting that no and that's why they're turning out to vote that's why they're creating companies that's why they're speaking out i think in ways that our parents never did it's true and and i i i just i i'm i'm so i'm so excited for your book being out there and the conversations uh, you're adding so much complexity uh, to a general conversation, we've we've been represented as a general, you know, public in in media in America, and by general, it means Mexican, mm -hmm. primarily Mexican public, mm -hmm. right? And 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 there's 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 just not enough, just layers into having these conversations, and and I'm so happy that you after uh, last election you were you were inspired and really you felt responsible. To, to navigate, I mean, you tracked across our nation to meet with big groups of people. What was what 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 were the biggest surprises that you took from from you know this travel that yeah. you did across America, and what were the things that that reminded you we are who we are? Yeah, um, I mean, honestly, every every story impacted me in different ways. The first thing that comes to, comes to mind in terms of you know my my eyes being very wide open was finding this like incredibly powerful and beautiful indigenous community in the south. Right, all of a sudden, I find myself um, in in rural Georgia and in South Carolina, and I'm you know I'm not I'm there and I'm spending time with a a, a big Mayan community that has been there for generations. Right, and and suddenly I'm 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 in a room. It's September 11, and I'm in this um, this like art center, and I see Mayan kids, um, you know, speaking in Ganjobal, speaking in Mam, speaking in their indigenous languages, and and doing so in a sea of like white folks. But they're doing it not for them; they're doing it for their parents because their parents had always felt ashamed of speaking in their language. You no, know? have always felt ashamed of of being who they were, and so a pattern that I noticed in that community was sort of the silence, right? When I would step into some rooms, a lot of the moms, a lot of the indigenous moms would be more reserved or would be silent or wouldn't speak because they've had to pass as Spanish speaking Latinos their whole lives, no? Um, when really their first language was mom, and so that that really impacted me. I think another story that, that I always think about was meeting Car Carolina Lopez, who's this incredible, a transgender activist, trans women in Arizona by the border. And so that chapter I titled Shining Light because with her, I, I was able to understand an element that I think is, is relevant among all, uh, all the Latinx community, but I think she exemplifies it in a way that really impacted me was, which is this idea that like, you know, many people are able to carry through the most difficult times, including now like COVID-19, because there's something at the end of the tunnel, there's some form of light at the end of the tunnel, some vision, some form of hope, and that makes, you know, so you keep going. You know, we always say that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. People like Carolina don't get any light, you know, because there are people that come to this country um, looking for opportunities that they didn't have in Latin America, where the average age for, for trans folks is no more than 35 years old. And yet someone like Carolina gets to Arizona, can't find a job, um, is criminalized time and time again, ends up in a detention center, is sexually abused, comes out, has no community, and yet she keeps on going. You know what I'm saying? So like that with her is just, it, it is a resilience that I think is just extraordinary and I think is, yeah. is present in all of us. But I look at her and, I, and I've learned so much from, from, the, from the trans, specifically the trans migrant community, which I also spent time with here in New York City under COVID, and how they get up every day and keep fighting and power through with no light among them is, 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 is amazing. It is my heart. That's just to hear you say that my heart was like just exploding because I, I get that. I get that. There's that, that word hope in Spanish. I've always loved mm -hmm. it more in Spanish, la esperanza. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's such a precious gift, you know, that, that we're all given from the moment we're born and, and life may have all these adversities tossed at you and yet you still have la esperanza the hope that you're gonna get to that one place you don't know what it is you don't know where when how but you're heading towards it and and that's that's pretty amazing um yeah what was i gonna say now you said you know talking about this story you you call that chapter shining light right i want to shine light on a topic that is very <laughs> it's it's very um 
it's very dear to me. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's very strong with me. It's not dear because mm -hmm. I'm as a, as a woman that now is in my, in my early forties, being a mom and being uh -huh. proud of all my you know, hyphens, I can honestly say that I am a proud Afro Latina. Mm -hmm. um, but for many, many years, that was just something that, that was easily diluted. It was just, it was, yeah. you were encouraged to dilute that in order for you to lavar la raza, for you to sort okay. of wash up and everything. And um, I had no idea that the, the uh, Enrique Tarillo, what's his name? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Enrique Tarillo, yeah. <laughs> yes, is a uh, Cubano. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the chairman yeah. of uh, the Proud Boys. And That's right. And I want us to talk about this because this is something. And and mind you, I'm gonna I'm gonna trail off a little bit, but you can always bring me back because it's you. No, no, no. I, we want to hear you trail. <laughs> I I participated, you know, earlier this fall in in like a group of you know a, a collective coming together, you know, to to amplify the message of Latinx pride and everything um, via you know like social media. And they had all these experts on and they were showing us all these decks with, you know, the, the, this is the Arizona market. This is the Florida market. Mm -hmm. this is the, these are the amount of people that are voting, the amount of people that are purchasing this, registered this. And I'm like, where is these coats? Where are the Afro Latinos? I saw yeah. a lot of Central American, primarily yep. Mexican. And mind you, I, I live now and I've, I've lived now in Los Angeles for 15 years now. And mm -hmm. I started these four years ago here in the West Coast. So a lot of our stories are about our community around us because we just yeah. don't have the budget to travel. And I get that. I understand the limitations when you don't have, you know, the economics to to basically cover all of your mm -hmm. stories across across our nation. But when you do is why is there a choice <laughs> to mm -hmm. not cover all of Latino communities, primarily the Afro Latino, which as a New Yorker, Washington Heights is 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 just like a little fucking Santo Domingo. <laughs> <laughs> I go to Pennsylvania, I go to Boston. I I but mean that's interesting because that's you know and that's I I actually I followed Dandeli, who's a who's a who's an Afro Latina poet. She's a, she's a writer, and she she actually said something similar to what you're saying, or her experience was similar. Where the reason why I was attracted to Danieli's story is because I I remember like I was on Instagram and I'm like stalking her and I'm like, wow, this girl is badass. And one of the reasons I thought she was badass is because of the way she like owned her Afro Latinidad and the way that she was speaking about it. So you know. Um, every, everything in her profile and her work was about that. Yet, Danieli, who Danieli is in New York, suddenly changes when she's in California. And so I followed her over to California and exactly, she, she, that's exactly what she was saying. She was like, you know, I came to California and suddenly it was like, I had to come out all over again, right? Because my story was suddenly erased again. And I, so I met Danieli in UCLA and she was giving a talk to like young, um, young Latino students, most of whom were Mexican, and in her conversation, she basically was just like, you know, immigrants also look like me, you know, and she had to sort of like re-educate people. I also migrated. When you migrate, it's not just about the borders, right? You can migrate many different ways into this country. You know, pe people like you are just like me. And I asked her at the end, I was like, where do you feel more comfortable? Here she says, with Latinos. In LA, she was like, among Black people. She's like, I don't feel loved among my own people, my own Latinos. And so all this to say that one of, one of the things in, in the book that I tried to do is understand how like who we are suddenly like changes by geography and by regions, right? And so it's, it's just so complex. It is, it is complex. And I will, and I, and I have to say that, that I'm very passionate about this subject because, you know, like it's, I, I should have been, and for many years I was the negative, the bottom of everybody's totem pole. It's like, oh, well, as long as I'm not that dark, mm. I can. I can make it, I can pass the passers, you know, you always, mm. you always hear that. And owning this, uh, owning who I am now that I'm a mother, now that I, I, I can, I should, it's my responsibility. Yeah. Made me also realize that there's just a lot about us that we don't know. That there's a lot about ourselves that, that we don't know. And it's coming to us like, like um, that poet does and, and educating. It's like, this is, these are the many complex faces of Latinidad. Let's go back to this Enrique guy because I, I don't even want to give it. But I yeah, don't go from like, well, I need to know a little bit about who we are. I didn't know you were Afro Latino. <laughs> so now, 
a motherfucking dude that is a proud boy and you kind of go how do you are you sick are you out of your mind is there a (laughs) dual personality here what what is going on So, so yeah, so for context, right? So Enrique Tarrio is the chairman of the Proud Boys. He's been roaming around the streets of New York himself. And the chairman of the Proud Boys happens to be an Afro-Latino. He is, he's an Afro-Cuban. So when I read that for the first time, I was like blown away. I was like, dudes like you. I was like, how, how is this possible? He's obviously not just a Proud Boy. He adores Donald Trump, like adores him. Um, And so, you know, I go down to Miami and again, I think taking a step back, part of the exercise of Latinx is that I have to break my own stereotypes about who we are, including that, yes, we too can be, we too are conservative, we too perpetuate racism and many other things, right? And so I I had to like, just keep that in mind. But going into my conversation with Enrique Tarrio, my first reaction was to be aggressive, to be like, reject everything he's for. Our ideologies couldn't be more different. Our obviously we're in completely two different sides of the political spectrum, but, and in his story, when he talks, you start to understand that Enrique is a, is a person that has sort of been lost in the system, right? He is someone that has been also lost by, by both Republicans and Democrats. Why? Because Enrique never fit anywhere, right? And so the more he talked, I was like, okay, there, there, there is, you do, I do try and understand sort of like, there is some form of pain that has led him to want to be accept, accepted so bad by white power, you know what I'm saying? Like there is something in him that has driven him to want to assimilate to Trumpism and to want to be part of the boys club because he doesn't want to be otherwise the way that he has his entire life, right? And so I think in Enrique, there is a pattern that we're starting to see that is kind of concerning, but is real among, you know, a growing, even just look at Donald Trump right now, right? He may win 30% of the Latino vote, there is a growing love for him, particularly among young Latino men, right? I was just in Arizona and I had the same conversation with young Latino men. You'll find the same thing in Florida and you'll, you'll find the same thing in different battleground states. And so we have, to, we have to start understanding why. Like, I think it goes beyond the like, they prioritize the economy to immigration. And I think it's driven, I think it also goes beyond like machismo. There's an element to that, but I think it's driven by this like, you know, deep desire to be part of the boys club and to assimilate to that power. And that's because at some point someone fucked up with them too. Sorry well, to use the word, but that's, no, but but that's true. Okay, please don't apologize. I mean, let's, let's be crass about, about everything that we're talking about. Like, yeah, we don't, we don't talk enough about how painful othering is, how much you, you know, and, and, and that, that creates a kind of compassion for, Mm -hmm. for your, for the elders, for your ancestors and, you know, your fathers, your mothers, your grandparents, when they came here and they brought you here, you were born here Mm -hmm. and how like, no, no, don't, don't speak Spanish or they dropped that, you know, that extra vowel in the name, the Italians did it for the love of God, you know, and when they migrated here. Um, But I'm, I'm just curious to, to understand where it comes from, you know, like I'm, I'm still in this inquiry, like when it comes to us as a, as a community, not just the community that's here in the States, but the community that is still there in, in their, in their native lands, this yeah. whole thing with colorism, like, does it have to do with, with colonization? Does it have yeah. to do with religion as a consequence of being, con- of being colonized? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think the, the erasure, you know, and, and I try and get a little bit into to that in the book, but of course the erasure starts on the other side of the border. I know there's 130 million people in Latin America that are of African descent, most of whom are completely lost within their countries because they, they're barely recognized. I just think about Mexico, like, you know, my, my dad is Mexican, my mom is Cuban, but in ju- just looking at Mexico itself, you know, that has at least 1 million Afro-Mexicans, is just now in 2018 or in 2019 that Afro-Mexicans were included in the constitution. They weren't even counted in the census until 2015. And so of course, like erasure, erasure starts there. And so again, the question is how does that translate here? And so I think, you know, there's a lot of elements, but I just talking right now, one, one story comes to mind of someone else that I interviewed for the book, Carolina Contreras, who is the owner of Miss Lisos, no? A, a, a beauty salon and they, they obviously a big clientele of them are Afro-Latinas and, I, and I'm remembering something that she said which was when she was growing up 
And when she was sort of, you know, brushing her sister's hair, um, they're, they're, they're Afro Latinas, she says that she remembers um, burning the scalp of her sister so bad because she wanted to, les quería alisar el pelo, no? She wanted to, to straighten their hair. And she was like, we wanted to assimilate so bad that it caused, that I physically caused harm on my own yeah. sisters, right? And so it's, it, it, it is, it, it's that real. to me says it all, yeah. Which is why I, you know, like I'm, I, I love, I love that you wrote this book. We owe it to ourselves to keep digging. And that's what you did. You, you were digging for four years to uncover the truths about ourselves so that we can better understand and we can forgive and we can also learn and we can evolve and we can grow. To me, I'm learning. And I do want to be clear, yeah. you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm learning. Um, it, it is like 1% of the entire story. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm not here to be a voice for it, but I'm here to, to help tell people's stories. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, some of it, as I was writing, I was just embarrassed to not, to not, to have taken so long to, to think about this, you know? Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy that. You didn't take too long. It's, it's good. You're, you're, you yeah. just arrived. You're, you're just getting started. Please. No te quite tanto años. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Wait, let me see. I just want to make sure that I, I we have covered what we talked about. Um, okay, looking at the presidential election, which is in less than nine days, of course. Yeah. How does the book fit Ooh. into the power of the Latino vote this cycle? That's one thing I've been listening. I'm listening to Maria Nojosa. I am listening to ABC News and New York Times, just so I can better understand. Because are you are you sick of it already, or are you like, <laughs> can we get this over with, or? What, I, I'm curious, like, what, what's your prediction? Like, what do you think is going to happen from your gut? Oh, 2016 was such a shock. Careful, because we're going to quote you. They're going to quote you from this. But what do you think? 2016 was such a shocker to me because I was so, I was so confident that, that we were all on the same page. Like, mm -hmm. I was like, we're all on the same page, right, America? Like, <laughs> and then, and then it turned out that America is bigger than, than my, my opinions and my views. <laughs> yes. So now, I, you know, four years later, tengo la esperanza que no hagamos los mismos errores, that we don't make mm -hmm. the same mistakes. And, um, but also it's work. I, I you know, today mm -hmm. we're working nine days away. Tomorrow yeah. I'll be having a conversation. I'll be listening to a podcast. I'll be spreading, you know, whatever yeah. it is to yeah. hear that resonates with me. That, that completely gives me that conviction that what, what I'm doing and what where I'm going with my vote is means mm -hmm. that my children and other people's children will be yeah. beneficiaries of this. Um, I'm just gonna keep going until until they tell us, okay, we have we have a winner. We got, we're good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know Which mean? who knows how long it'll take. Um, I, don't know, but but I can't tell you. I can't tell you. I'm telling you, America, America surprised me and I can't I'm speechless <laughs> for four years. I've been like, I, I have no idea. Yeah. No, I feel I feel somewhat confident. Um, as I said before, one one of the obviously the patterns that I notice is this just like rejection of the status quo, obviously by young Latinos. I think people are I think young Latinos are we, I mean more than almost four million Latinos have already voted, um, which is like huge compared to the exact same moment we were in, which was about like one point six million, right? So we're we're already out there. Um, I think it's driven by a lot of young Latinos. I think obviously COVID-19 accentuates everything. You know, it, it is life and death for, for, many, for many Latino communities. Um, I think the hate that Latinos have felt in the last four years, you can be the most privileged person. You can be the most, um, you know, the, the, your, your skin can be lighter than this wall. But in Trump's America, there's some point in which you've been otherized, no? And, and, and I think no one, no one gets to escape that reality. Never. And then I also think there's like- Me Enrique. <laughs> Me Enrique, no, exactly. But that's the thing. And you know, that's, that was very interesting embedding with a lot of Latino Trump supporters where they tell me a lot of things to my face, but then when you follow them into the Trump rallies or into Trump spaces, son los que están en la esquina, no? And, and they're, 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 they're still a- there's still an us and them, no, and which, which is which is sad to watch. Um, but, but anyways, but I think I think I think the difference here is that I look at 2008. No, I look at the history of Barack Obama. You win elections with stories. No, when people feel like they're part of a story yep. and they're inspired, you win. No change, change and hope. People believed in it. It was historic. And I think now the story is, is more simple. It's like the his the history of defeating Donald Trump. Unfortunately, that 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 is a story. And I think. 
that will drive people. And I think Latinos have been at the centerpiece of that story. In every battleground state, they've been the victims of some form of, of hate. Um, and I, I think that will drive them. Yeah, I, I think that's what we're seeing. I hope so. I, 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 heard a, I, I heard a podcast that, that made me feel really good. I think it was last Friday. And how even though we're talking about like how many conservative, how conservative we are primarily as we're known as, as a community, um, there's still more Democrats within our collective communities than, than we are Republicans. So that made me feel like, oh, okay, crap. Like we're just focusing too much on, on the 20% and not the 60% of, of registered voters that who are voting. Mm -hmm. And um, I just hope, I just want to see it out. I just, I, I hope it's there. Um, as we know, the Latinx community has become the nation's largest voting bloc. Is the sleep, the sleeping giant finally awake? Do you think that we have finally oh, yeah. adapted us? Yeah, I think that's it. And I, and I, that, that term, I think, I think the difference is like for, for so long, we've been waiting for answers and waiting for resources and waiting for people to knock on our door, which is why the sleeping giant is the word. No, it's not so much that Latinos were lazy, you know, or that we didn't vote. It's that people didn't really win our vote. No, they, they asked for our You're vote. Talking to us. Exactly. Yeah. I, th I do think we, we're, we've seen a lot of progress lately. But I think that's a big difference. You, know, you win the vote or you ask for the vote. And I think regardless of how people feel about what happened in this election cycle, I think no one's waiting for answers, right? And, and to me, what, what really excites me is um, you look at 2018, you, know, you look at something like, obviously, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez wins. You can love her or not love her, but she, she is changing Congress, right? And then you zip, you fast forward two years and the people that are running for Congress um, already indicate that 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 change is happening now you have a queer latina from california that's running you have a queer afro latino that's running you have a latino and arab a uh, person that's running uh, you have a latino and indigenous veteran that's running and so it is it is it is diversified and different in a way that i don't think we've ever seen and so that that gives me a lot of hope that's amazing um, it's so it, I, I, the sleeping giant. It just made me think of that moment in David Lynch's uh, Dune when uh -huh. Kyle Lachlan wakes up and he says, "Father, the sleeper has awakened." I really <laughs> sorry. I'm just like I'm such a sci-fi geek. I always think in the in those terms, but no, it, no, no. But that makes me happy. I, and I and I and I and I think that what what I've learned now with having this conversation with you is one. <sighs> finish your book, which I am. I just, I'm in the middle of it. I'm, I'm so excited. Thank um, you. Share it, make sure that everybody that you know, uh, not just Latin, Latinx, but, but, you know, everybody that you know that has, has an affinity for the Latinx community must read it. Um, and I know that we just have to keep reminding ourselves that, that, that we are for every one bad step, there's five better steps that we're making as a community because we are growing and 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 we're, we're definitely understanding where we need to go and what we want for ourselves what thank you what do you what are your hopes for your book what are your hopes for 2021 now that your book has launched um honestly right now i'm just so election focused but but my hope is when i think of of what drives people to vote or what drives people to ask others to vote is like you do it because at the end of the day, you, you do it because you believe that you are worthy of change, you know, that, that you are worthy of being being part of the change that you want to see. And so my only hope is that, you know, some people that felt like they weren't they weren't part of this country, that um, that their voice didn't matter. I, I hope that it instills a little bit of, of, of dignity in them. You know? And so if, if I can get one person to do that, I'll be happy. And then also, yes, you're right. Like it is it is a vote. It is a vote. It is a <laughs> vote. See, I'm so. <laughs> No, nah. no, no, no. But it is it is a, a book as much for us as it is for and uh, for everyone else. Right. Because I think we, we can talk about this all day long. But if, if other folks like if, 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 you know, all of the white folks in the country don't don't talk about it, then, you know, that's that's a whole other battle there. Yeah. And I think that that is the that is the battle. 
first yeah. we have to continue we have to win we have to win our, our little battles and then we have to come together as a force united front to win the battle yeah. i know that we wanted to open the conversation up for some questions from from our awesome 41 peoples thank you so much for tuning <laughs> in this is so amazing um is there anything before we open the quite the, the you know the q a uh, is there anything that you wanted to cover that i forgot to um to mention? no 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 just i just want to thank i want to thank you um i want to thank mcnally um you know it is obviously it's a tough time for everyone but i'm i'm so grateful for for you all for hosting this um and and it truly means a lot i i live two blocks away from from one of the bookstores and so it is it's it's part of my everyday and i'm just i'm i'm very grateful for for you guys like having opening up the space amazing and that's all anytime yeah. you want to talk anytime you want to talk i mean it is covid the rona has us all home so um just hit me up because i i would love to have the just these frequent conversations because yeah, I, no. I know we're in such dire need of 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 just solidarity and and sharing knowledge and and uh and growing so that's something i i definitely want to you know extending that invitation to you now thank um, you a ver, you, las preguntas. Nice. <laughs> and obviously, you know, questions will be for you too, Zoe, because <laughs> you, you are Zoe. Um, okay, let's see. So, Betsaida Alcantara, you know what? I, I have to say this. Betsaida is a dear friend of mine, and she is, honestly, Betsaida, I just have to laugh because she, she, I've been doing many book events and like she's the whole, she's always in all of them and she's always asking questions. And I, I, at some point you will have to get sick of my voice with Saida, but you don't. Okay, so why are Latino men supporting Trump in such large numbers as compared to 2016? Mm. The thing is that it, it's, it's been, I think the concerning thing is that it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily that they're increasing that much more is that it's constant, right? And I think after four years, people thought that those numbers would go down, no? Um, but the problem is that it's been a constant 30%, no? And that's that's not necessarily going down. And then I think it's just the obvious, no? I think for, for we see um, uh, the, the gender gap widening, you know, there's now more Latinas than ever that are going democratic compared to Latino men. Um, and then the inverse where like suddenly you're right there there is an inching towards latino an inching towards trump among latino men honestly at the end of the day it must be some form of sexism no people see trump people see a man in office no they see a strong man and i i don't know i can't understand that i can't even fathom that um, but i think that turns on some some men no some men that that do want to see that power in in the white house That's and that do like to see that language no that banter yeah. talk it's it, it, like it's gonna be weird, and the fact that we know exactly what we're saying, that we know exactly where mm -hmm. it comes from, is 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 uh, the part that we should always keep um, arguing about. But um, but what you're saying about women, uh, Latinx women are over-indexing uh, more mm -hmm. than any woman, uh, you know, any American woman, white, black, yeah, uh, that's right, anything. We're over-indexing in college enrollment, starting our own businesses. Our buying power is doubled because not only do we buy for our homes, we also buy for our parents because we take care of our people. So never underestimate the power of a, of a female Latinx. And, um, and, and I think that we're just getting started. I, I'm, I'm, I'm so pumped about what the next four years will be um, mm -hmm. in our next election and, and the kind of conversations that we're going to have um, from, from a female Latinx perspective more yeah. than the male Latinx perspective. I just wanted to add that because somebody- No, it's- that And I'm like, what? Let me see the stats. Holy shit, that's amazing. I was so, like, <laughs> I was so pumped. No, but it's true. Um, I, mean, I see another one that says, how do we help to move the conversation away from only an, an immigration story? Mm. I mean, that's that is that that's a million dollar question. I think you're right, right? We we look at the debate stages, at the debate questions. The only the only time when they talk about Latino voters, you're right. They only talk about immigration. I think I think it may start changing because you look at the Latino electorate, and you know, more than forty percent are millennials or Gen Zers. And I think obviously, although immigration is personal for all of us in some way or in some form, um, that demographic shows you that 
they are interested in other things and that starts to take on more power no they're in, obviously they're interested in healthcare they're 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 you know we're entrepreneurs and in, in, in incredible ways um we care about education we, we care about everything else but i do think the fact that latino voters are so young i think once we get past the selection i think that'll start to to shift the conversation into you know more more issues um, oh, but can i add I think that that how do we help to move the conversation away um, when the 524 children that have been separated from their families get to go back mm -hmm. home to their parents? I feel like we we that's true. I, I under I understand. There are so many topics that 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 we that are very important in our nation, mm -hmm. but they have to take a supporting role if a child right. is separated from their parents. And 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 nobody, nobody, no adult in America can can speak for the, for that child. And I think that you're absolutely right. It's it's so it's so important that that we we have to be that hammer that keeps banging on that nail until until our next president uh, just gives us answers because we, yeah. we 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 have to. We, no child should ever be left behind, you know. And and that's you're just, right. And, and I will say that I, I do think it is the there's no better way of understanding what's at stake in this election than through the immigration lens. Right. And I think you can be, you know, a mom in the Midwest that has nothing to do with the border immigration and you see those images and that touches you. And so I do I, I do think there is a lot of power in, in framing the conversation around that because it just shows you how this is beyond politics and parties. Right. And it's it's about. <laughs> it's about morality and humans and, yeah yeah okay um, what, what other questions uh, zoe what, zoe why do we see so few latino celebrities standing up for the bigger issues that affect our people i'm no 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 no, no. i i mean please follow she se puede please follow eva longoria please always hear every time america ferrera opens her mouth just hear her out because that lady is spitting knowledge and, and, and inspiration at all times. Mm -hmm. We are, we're all coming together. Paula and I are having a conversation. I'm lending support because her book is out and I need to read this book. So please understand that, that yes, we may be a few in a sea of, 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 of other, you know, uh, ethnic groups, but um, we, are, we are definitely many and, and we're growing. So your job, it's not just us to talk. You guys also have to have to listen. I don't I you don't have to follow me or anything, but if I'm ever having these conversations, please, please, please try to listen in to see if, if something that I'm listening into may be of use to you. Um, and I do have to give you pro I mean, I think it is you're right, there's there's many, but I do think it's it, it is hard and I'm, I mean, I'm, I, to, to, to be you no, and, and, and to be in the spotlight and to take a stance. And I, I can't imagine, like that takes a lot of courage, I think, right? Particularly in a time when like people I'm sure like bombard you. And so I think, I think it's very honorable like to see, you know, people like you and Eva Longoria and America Ferreira that are like truly, truly speaking up and speaking out. And like, I think that's yeah. that intersection of like politics and, and like, and they, um, and and Hollywood is that's amazing to watch. I think that makes a big difference. Thank you for saying that. That I then I will continue. I will continue to grow. <laughs> oh yeah, no, we need you. We need you. Um, what you want? You want to read a question aloud? Sí, maybe a lo mejor una más. ¿Qué figura de la comunidad latina se admiraban? Oh yeah, okay, that's a cool one. Yeah, when you were growing up, which who did you who did you admire within the within the community? Did you have someone? Oh, I see, see, see. I mean. <laughs> It, and I keep learning, I keep learning about so many people, but uh, like from, from a theater standpoint, because I'm a New Yorker and, and I will always be a diehard New Yorker, um, Raul Culia was just somebody that every time he would speak to me, he, he, was, he was this iconic figure because he was layered. He was so layered mm -hmm. and, and you didn't know, you're like, it, it Boricua, like uh -huh. it's Italiano and he would do different accents and 
and right. like I just and I feel like he's inspired so many actors like like um Oscar Isaacs and uh -huh. that, that say you know what I don't want I don't only want to stand for my community and for my race when I am an artist and I need to be allowed to be a chameleon so he's somebody I admired I think that Ed, Edward James almost also had that um in, in the beginning of his career and then mm -hmm. and then his voice became greater in his community because he knew that he, his community was so underserved I was also listening yesterday to a podcast of Danny Trejo and that uh -huh. is a story that is so inspiring and um and he's so he's so uh gentle and and a, uh -huh. and a person um from females I I you know AOC I have to say she's the shizza and um she is yeah she, yeah. she's a big one for me she really is, and I and I think that you know you, you you listen to her conversations when she started out, and you can definitely the you know detect uh, the nerves, you know, because she was so like, oh my god, like I, I you guys called me on my bluff, and I'm here, you know. Yeah, and, and I love and what she said one time when she what? when she was like prepping for for hearings, right? Because you you see politicians and they just like speak, and you're like, whatever, they have this, they just do it like that. But she was like. I think she did like an Instagram or, or like a Twitter post where she showed like all the different post-its that she uses like to prep and like everything that she goes through. And I think that speaks to, at least it speaks to me a lot. No, I feel like every time, every time I have to do like something on TV and I say, yeah, I always get this like imposter syndrome almost where I'm like, do I, yeah, I, don't, I'm, I don't know if you felt like that, but I'm always like, I live in it. I'm an actor. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure you do. But I think it's real, right? And then you see her and you're like, wow, like if AO, AOC is going through this, no, and she, she is prepping. And I don't know, it, it, it spoke to me a lot. Pero ponete a pensar también que con de la manera, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak in English because I, in case people are tuning in and don't speak Spanish, I want you guys to be a part of this. But um, in the way that she was picked on was grotesque. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. me, I felt scared for her. I would, had I been her, I would have immediately curled up into a ball i would have changed you know the strength of my voice because it 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 cuts you at the knees you know what i mean it, yeah it hurts. and it only yeah. made her stronger that is a testament of her resilience but also her purpose because every okay. time i feel like every time that that woman goes to sleep she may feel defeated but she wakes up and she goes, I went to bed with everybody that 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 goes to sleep for another day that has nobody to speak for them. And yeah. she wakes up like rejuvenated. And, and that is definitely somebody that that is raising me. And I know that I'm older than her, but I feel I feel like a better person. I'm able to understand my nation. I'm able to mm -hmm. I'm able to understand my community. I'm able to understand women when when I see her, you know, and I and I, I hear her speak, which is pretty inspiring. Even just today, Donald Trump said insulted her. <laughs> um, he was like, what what did he say? He was like, did AOC even go to college? Right? Which is <laughs> when he said that I was like, well, there there goes another million votes. <laughs> keep keep it going. Yeah. Like, you keep keep yeah, keep, keep opening your mouth. Yeah. It seems to be working for us. Um yeah. any anybody, any other last questions that um that you would um, want to speak before we we I mean there is I'm just we can do one more. Um I mean, the last one. How do you connect to Latinx in other countries outside of the US? I'm in Toronto, Canada, and grew up on the West Coast, craving mi gente. I even grow maize from Chiapas in my backyard in the city, and I'm teaching my daughters our roots. That's adorable. That's amazing. <laughs> um, I, have a, I have a question for you. Oh, that was a question that you have to answer. Hold that on. was a, yeah, yeah. I'm just, yeah, I'm just, this is the last one that popped up. I mean, one of the, one of the, um, the pushbacks against the, the term Latinx, right, is that it is, you know, rightly so, is that it is a very US centric word, you know, and that it erases sort of the connectivity to Latin America. And, and the, the way that I see it is that that is that is that is right. You know, the, when I think of Latinx, it is it is a word to me right now that is describing the experience of Latinos in this country. Um, I do think, I, and I think I hope that part of the conversation, like for part of the conversation forces us to, to when I think of everyone that I interviewed, you know, obviously there's like the, the story starts on the other side of the border. You know, and, I, and I do hope that the conversations inspire us to like create a more like collective 
at least just to understand what like trans and queer folks are, are going through in other parts of Latin America. When we think about Afro Latinas, like how does that story begin truly in Latin America? No, what's the origin there? Um, and so I think there's a lot more, there's a lot more dialogue that needs to happen, a lot more. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm curious to see how, what, 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 what goes on after this. I don't know. Do you, do you think that Latinx, the term will have it, the ability to sort of transcend, like re reach I out? I hope so. Me too. I hope so. I think we're, in, we're very much in the initial stage of like, what the hell is this word? And like, why are we even talking about it? Which I think is good. And so I think we're very much in the initial of like, let's, let's all sort of grow accustomed to it or, or not. And, and we're not like, why is that? No. Yeah. Um, but I, I do hope that it, you know, I, I do hope that it becomes um, that there is a growing movement behind it. I, hope so. I can't wait to hear like Latinx in Europe, you know, I self-identify all the Dominicans in Germany, like we're Latinx. I'll be like, yes, <laughs> we're growing. I Are there a lot of Dominicans Latinx. in Germany? Yeah, very few. Not as many, not, not, not as many as as in Italy, or you know, but oh, but oh, but I tend to be like I'm pretty sure you do the same thing. Like wherever I go, they're Dominicans. Yeah. Japan. Yeah, but yeah. Those, yeah. Those are my family. I have cousins. I have family in Japan. So I'm like, where are my Dominicans? That's a from? show. That's a show you need to start. <laughs> I know Dominicans in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> One okay. last question. I'll leave you. I'll leave you with this, only because I'm personally curious. Who okay. inspired you to be a journalist? Do you consider like is that how you identify as a journalist, as a writer? Um, I so I'm I'm careful with the term, right? So the way my everyone in my family is a journalist, so I sort of I, I tried to escape it, and then I and then I, I never could. But my dad's a journalist, my mom's a journalist, my grandpa's a journalist, and so I, I grew up in I grew up in a household full of journalists. The way that I sort of saw my trajectory was like it was like a ping pong between the world of journalism and politics no or storytelling and politics and to me it was like wherever wherever i think the balance of power is i'll go there you know wherever i think i can be i can create more change i'm gonna go there and i do think i have more maybe it's like millennials no like i have more of a flexibility in terms of wearing different hats than i think like someone like my dad did no or my mom were like he is a journalist you stay in your lane and that is you i see it sort of like this is where i create change i um, and, and yeah, I, 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 you know, it's, it's a lot of people question, like, can, can you, ha how do you go from politics to journalism? Right. And, and again, I, for me, it was like, I didn't, I wasn't learning anymore in politics. And I felt like it was my responsibility to question politics and power from outside through journalism. And so I just see them too, as like two vehicles of, of change. Um, so yeah, so right, right now, um, I like to say I'm a storyteller, but yes, right, right now I'm using the vehicle of journalism. Very good. And who who is the, who is the quintessential you know figure that inspired you to to follow this journey for yourself? Um, I I honestly think it was my dad. I mean, I think from from my dad, it, it was both of my parents. I, I from from them, I've learned the two most important things that I've applied in in every industry that I work in. It, which is my mom showed me, regardless of who's in front of you, like people deserve to be seen with dignity. And so that is every, every story I approach is like, everyone deserves that, no? Um, and then with my dad, who obviously gets like kicked out of press conferences and like, uh, you know, everyone he talks to, it's like, you you have a responsibility to question figures of authority. No, and that with those two mantras is sort of what like has guided me. And I think, you know, it's, it's a constant inspiration to, to find that. Well, you conduct yourself in that grace no. so please feel proud and tell them tell oh, them thank you a great job they can pat thank themselves so on the back they can take all the credit <laughs> you're doing an amazing no. job thank you for thank writing you, this Zoe. Blog. thank you for this conversation anytime you want to you want to have it again i'm here thank you so much and thank you everyone for tuning in i know it's a uh, what day are we in T monday tuesday it, it's well, Monday. it's Monday. It's Monday. It's Monday. It's Monday. But I, I, and I'm, everyone is sick of Zoom calls. But I'm so, so grateful for for everyone for for tuning in and and to you, Zoe. Absolutely. So thank you. Of course. Hello, Zoe. Thank, thank you. you so much. And um, thank you all for joining us. Please vote. Please buy books. <laughs> That's about it. Yes. Thank you. Buenas noches. Bye. Bye. Bye.